you see the exhibition, is the pink that we know. It's the pink of about the last 150 years in Western Euro-American culture. And it includes uh, this whole idea that pink is something that appeals to little girls and to women, that you can sell a lot of toys to little girls by having them be pink. And the toys here have ranged from 1950 to the present. People recognize all of their My Little Ponies and their trolls and a lot of things from the 50s and 60s that were very much about inculcating the feminine mystique into little girls. So tiny little pink washer dryers and stoves and refrigerators and sewing machines, as well as more recent things like uh, pink guitars and pink computers for all of which their parents paid a pink tax uh, because it, when things are made in pink, you get charged more for them. So in the first room, you'll see the feminization of color. How it was that, again, from about 1840 to through the 1990s, in the Western world, pink was thought of as a feminine color. And you see with the first uh, crinoline dress there, the reason pink became feminized, that color became feminized, was that it left the masculine wardrobe. So that men were wearing, especially upper class men, were wearing black or dark sober colors. And other colors went to women, like pink. Now, with the first crinoline dress, though, they're already starting to use aniline dyes. And so although pink previously had been worn, as we'll see, by men and women, and had been a very aristocratic color, now it started to get a little déclassé. Uh, novelists would say, oh, you look at a crowd and you see all the little spots of pink and lilac where the maids are going out in their new clothes. So by the turn of the century, the fashion elite was turning towards what they like to think of as 18th century pale aristocratic pinks. By about 1910, people like Paul Poiret drew back in revulsion from all these pale pinks and said, enough with the nuances of nymph's thigh. Now we need to have some bright, bold colors. So you get things like brilliant cherry pinks and purples and turquoise. Then, of course, you get Coco Chanel saying that Poiret's vivid colors made her nauseated. And she wanted to bring in things like the little black dress and navy blue and beige. We all know that the 20s was a period for the little black dress, not just by Chanel, but by every designer. But what I hadn't realized before working on this show was that 20s was also very much a period of the little pink dress. Everybody was making them. In fact, in this picture, uh, the palest pink is by Chanel, and the black dress is by someone else entirely. If you remember from Great Gatsby, there's a scene when Gatsby's rival, the really hateful married man, says that Gatsby could never have gone to Oxford or Cambridge because he's wearing a pink suit. And this is not to imply that Gatsby was effeminate, but rather that he's lower class. He doesn't realize that this kind of flashy dressing is wholly inappropriate for a man of the ruling class. Now, as you go on in the first room, you'll come to a section with a little clip from Funny Face, the scene where the fashion editor is saying, banish the beige, bury the black, think pink. And suddenly, everything is pink. It's a very amusing little sequence of images, but then one of the little fashion girls says to the editor-in-chief, but Miss Prescott, you're not wearing pink. And Miss Prescott goes, I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> so you realize that even in the decade where think pink is ubiquitous, that the feminine mystique is inculcating pink everywhere, there's still a sense that it's not serious and it's something that someone who is playing a serious role in life is going to reject. So the next few images will show some of the amazing pink dresses from the 50s. We have Dior, who absolutely loved pink. Whoops, sorry. Norman Norell. You have basically Balenciaga. Every major designer is creating things in pink. Pink fashion everywhere. We also find lots of pink interiors. And the idea, again, as um, Pink is something that mothers are encouraged to put their daughters in pink. So people will start treating them as girls, even when they're infants, and they'll get in touch with their essential femininity. 
is kind of a combination of conservative politics in the Cold War era and a debased Freudianism, that they're all supposed to get in touch with their femininity uh, and in the most cliched sense that it will be domestic and sweet and obedient or else very sexualized. So it's either Mamie Eisenhower and First Lady Pink or it's in Marilyn Monroe and sort of pink diamonds, but it's going to be blush pink, baby pink, um, Barbie pink, bordello pink. It's always going to be some kind of exaggerated idea of feminine pink. You do have some men wearing some things that are pink. Brooks Brothers have been making pink shirts since the 1920s, and in the 1940s and 50s, they started making them for women, too, because so many people were borrowing men's shirts or wearing boys' shirts. They did a collaboration with Vogue and did a whole series of women's shirtwaist dresses, et cetera. In addition, you'll find in the 50s a kind of um, rock and roll component to pink. So people like Elvis Presley had a pink Cadillac, wore pink sports jackets, and you'd have the beginnings of tropical pink. So you have sub-themes which are not quite the same as feminine pink, but which exist there right in the heart of the pink decade. The 60s are actually even pinker than the 1950s. If the 50s had advertising like you're prettier when pinkier, um, the 60s also had fashion articles where they talked about rose jeune fille, young girl pink, that you wear when you're young and you keep wearing as long as your face allows you to do so. <laughs> so although we think of courage as being associated with white, there's also a lot of this naive or sweet or young girl pink. The names, if anything, in the 60s are even more infantilizing. There's strawberry ice cream pink. It's all those kind of names. If Mamie Eisenhower had been famous for pink, so was Jackie Kennedy, who wore pink often, especially for events with de Gaulle, for example, in France, and traveling to India. Barbie actually doesn't get pink until the 1970s. Prior to that time, she was extremely fashionable in little miniatures of Parisian styles, and then in the late 60s, London styles. But in the 70s and 80s, she goes down market and younger, for a much younger audience, and her smile gets bigger, and her clothes get very bright pink and sparkly. So you, as you go through the rest of the 20th century, you do find that in the 80s and 90s, there's some emphasis on a new, more punky and more powerful attitude towards pink. So in the 80s and 90s, magazines will say, this is not your mother's pink. You know, This is not cup making cupcakes at home pink. You have to be bad enough to wear this pink. Or you have you know, pink for um, breast cancer and the idea that you can be powerful and be a woman. Nevertheless, the dominant idea still, right through the 90s, is the idea of pretty and pink and a kind of romantic princess image of pink. So that's what the first room in the show is about. Then when we go in the second room, we look at pink before, after, and outside that 150 years of Western pink. We find, for example, that uh, in Asia, pink has been a unisex color for millennia, and pink dyes are important in clothes in India, Japan, China. The dyes come to Europe, and we do have some, you'll see in a minute, some images of men and women wearing pink clothes in the Middle Ages. But the dye is rather pale and fugitive. In the 18th century, you get a new dye, Brazilium, which comes from Brazil. The whole country is named after the dye. It makes a huge impact everywhere in Western fashion, but particularly in the court, the French court. And suddenly, pink is the most fashionable aristocratic color for men and for women, for boys and for girls. In only one way is pink targeted as feminine, and that's in terms of makeup. So for example, Madame de Pompadour, who loved pink for clothes, paintings, furnishings, Sevres porcelain, also wore pink makeup. And in that respect, it was coded as feminine. Not just in France, but in ancient China as well. So here you see a medieval image, and you can see a man wearing pink. But it's not a very important color until the 18th century. That's the, that's the first time that rose comes to mean pink in French. And the word pink 
comes to refer to the color in English. Prior to that time, they referred to the flowers or to its use as a metaphor. So in Shakespeare, I'm in the pink of health, doesn't mean you've got pink cheeks, it means you're in the flower of health. Here we have Madame de Pompadour putting on her makeup, and blushing was very loaded then. Blushing was the idea that if you were a modest woman, things would make you blush, sexual things. Whereas if you were a hardened libertine, you could hear or see anything and you wouldn't blush. So you'd have to put on an artificial blush to pretend to be innocent. So they had this idea that, yes, it was aristocratic, but it was also kind of a prostitute thing. So how did pink and blue come about? Well, the a story that always begins for Americans is in Little Women. When Amy has twins and she says, we're going to put a pink ribbon on the girl and a blue ribbon on the boy in the French style so you can always tell the difference. That novel was published after the Civil War, and I went back and found French fashion magazines in the 1860s that did indeed have baby clothes for christenings, etc., coded pink for girls and blue for boys. And that seems to be ultimately where we got it in America. Uh, but they got a bit confused in America because there they saw right away that this was a great way to sell more baby clothes. So instead of just having it for occasional events or christenings, you start to have manufacturers and department stores promoting it as a way of selling more clothes. But they get confused. Some stores and some magazines think that pink is for boys. So one much quoted statement from 1918 has, I think, a Philadelphia magazine, The Infant's Room, uh, talking about how pink is a stronger and more decided color, and therefore it's more appropriate for a boy whereas blue, which is sweeter and daintier, is more appropriate for a girl. But then you have other accounts where people will write into magazines and go, what, pink for a boy? Why, in our family, it was always pink for a girl. And in fact, Time Magazine does a survey of department stores all over America and finds that exactly 50% of them have pink for girls and blue for boys, and the other 50% have it the other way around. So there's a lot of confusion. I personally think that they ultimately in the US went for the French version because of Blue Boy and Pinky, which got tremendous publicity when they were purchased by an American millionaire. Of course, it was purely chance that he didn't buy Pink Boy uh, and any one of a number of images of girls wearing blue, but it can be just that arbitrary. The point is there's nothing really pink uh, that girls have to latch on to. Um, nothing really feminine about pink. It just happened to work out that way in Western culture. Uh, partly because of pink's association with pink parts and sexuality in male-dominated culture. The sexual one will be seen as the female. And partly also because of the French uh, tragedy in the French court and the idea of putting the heir to the French throne under the protection of the Virgin Mary, making blue a little bit more likely there to be seen as masculine. Um, so arbitrary, and again, reinforcing Michel Pastoreau's point that it's society that makes color. In India, pink was always a unisex color. Diana Vreeland famously said that pink is the navy blue of India. Pink is also very much a unisex color in other cultures in East Asia, such as China and Japan. When Elsa Schiaparelli created her shocking pink in the later 1930s, she described it in Shocking Life, saying that this was a color, a color of China and Peru, not a color of the West, which is very interesting because it does have a lot of impact in Latin culture and in Asian culture. But what she mentions in passing in the English edition, but not in the American edition, is that when she first showed these colors, this color to her colleagues, they said, you can't use this, black people wear this color. And she said, but black people are often very stylish. So that got me thinking, was it the case, in fact, that within the African diaspora, pink was a popular color? And in fact, the evidence did seem to indicate that that was the case. You saw pink in Asian cultures, 
You saw pink in Latin cultures, and you also saw pink in African and Afro-Caribbean culture. So here, for example, we see in Harlem, Sugar Ray Robinson in front of his pink Cadillac. And I really think that you have people like Elvis Presley getting their pink from African-American stars like Sugar Ray Robinson. And in fact, that the whole entrance into rock and roll comes through the African-American perspective. You also famously have it with sapeurs, and we have African fashions in the exhibition as well. Then you have it in punk, at where the lead guitarist for The Clash said that pink was the only true rock and roll color. And you have it very much in a big way in hip hop. For women, but also for men, particularly after 2002, uh, with the rapper Cameron wearing his famous pink mink to New York City Fashion Week. Pink has continued to be a color for sportswear and a very important color in the African American community, one which I think has given a lot of men the courage to wear pink. Here we have the sex sign for Vivian Westwood's store. And the idea of pink also being associated with pink parts, like lips, nipples, genitals, and also with pinky Caucasian skin and the idea of nakedness and exposure. Paul Poiré played with the idea of pink nipples with this brassiere. Scaparelli, of course, with her phallic shoe. The whole idea we talk about lingerie pink, as though that's a term, but again with the idea of exposure of pinkish skin. And then, of course, the idea of flowers. Most people don't study botany anymore, but if we did, you would know that flowers were the sex organs of plants. So the idea of dressing women up as flowers really is to imply that they're fertile, beautiful, and possibly also that their beauty is as fleeting as that of a flower. And flowers, of course, give way to fruit, so again, you have the idea of fertility. But the fact that this has been latched onto pink in some cultures, but not others, is crucial. Because pe once people see something as being the case in their culture, they often become fixated on it and think it's that way everywhere. So I actually read scientific articles which claimed that the reason that girls are hardwired to love pink is because in ancient prehistoric days, the men were out hunting and the women were out gathering fruits which were pink or orange or yellow or anyway, not green. So the fact that it's only in a handful of cultures limited in time and space that pink was feminine didn't stop these so-called scientists coming up with their ideas for why pink is hardwired into girls' brains. This association with sweetness also may be related to the idea of fruits and flowers, but it's become part of the image of pink. And of course, it was one of the things that the millennial generation started to question a few years ago when they wondered whether you could have pink that wasn't quite so sugary sweet and docile or so hypersexual, so childish or so hypersexual. Now, Dior, as we said, really loved pink. Here's his Venus ball gown after the goddess of love. And he had a huge impact on fashion from the 50s on. Jacques Fath taking that lingerie pink and even having a lace-up corset dress in 1949, years before Madonna. Yves Saint Laurent, who always loved a kind of shocking pink, even in the years when pink was totally demodé, and who here has this idea of almost wrapping this woman up as a, as a goodie with a big bow on it. When you come see this in the show, also look at the little uh, fan next to it from innocent pre-Freudian times, when you could have a fan with a little pussycat with its pink mouth and its pink tongue and its pink ribbon. Pink, as we'll hear later today, has been a very important color in Japan, uh, where it's a big part of girl culture. And it's also been picked up particularly by Rei Kawakubo, but also by a number of other designers and artists who've questioned the idea of pink. Um, and there are many words in pink, many words for pink in Japanese, including a couple that go way back 
a thousand years before there was specific words for pink in, say, English or French, uh, because pink was such an important color. There's also a loan word, pinku, which refers to Western pink that's come into the culture. Uh, pink hair dye was very popularized in Japan. And of course, pink has been very important in the LBGT community, in part because of the appropriation of the pink triangle, which was used by the Nazis as a sign for homosexual men in concentration camps, and which was then taken over as a color of gay liberation. Very importantly, because pink then in Weimar, Germany, had not been a sign of gay rights, that was lavender, but rather it was a sign of sex workers. Now this idea of that pink can be political spread from the gay rights movement to uh, all kinds of women's rights movement, including the pink sari revolution in India, where this politicized Western idea of pink has come in in a culture where it didn't exist traditionally. Code pink. Barbie pink, which is so controversial and is part of the sort of tacky, uh, low-end plastic toy aspect of pink, which has also been a part of its image for more than 100 years. So it's not just feminine and childish, but also has a kind of artificial, fake quality to it, which can be problematic or can be fabulous, because there is something about the dreamlike artificiality of pink, which can be very appealing to a fashion sensibility. So nowadays you have a whole range of designers who have been questioning whether you can have pink and pastels that are not just sweet and weak. We have Prada asking that specifically. We have uh, Alessandra Michiel at Gucci who has been making pink a big feature of his maximalist fashion for men as well as women. Of course we have Ray Kawakubo of Comme des Garçons who's probably done more than anyone to make uh, pink an important co color, especially with collections like 18th century punk, where she took an 18th century floral print and put it on this kind of samurai armor, a far cry from a woman dressed as a flower waiting to be plucked by a male admirer. Again, from Rei Kawakubo, in contrast to the wide paniers of an 18th century gown, the enormous shoulders of her 18th century punk ensemble. And then uh, people like Raf Simmons, now at Calvin Klein, formerly uh, Jill Sander, doing bright pink suits for men, and Phoebe Philo, formerly of Celine, the thinking woman's designer, uh, doing beautiful pink, indicating that for intelligent men and women, it's possible to wear pink now, that it's no longer a color that's looked down on, uh, as it was, say, in Legally Blonde, when you couldn't believe that this girl was seriously a student at Harvard Law School, because how could she wear pink? Instead, pink has now become not just pretty, but also cool and androgynous, punk and powerful, for men and women, for people of all sexes, a color whose meaning has truly been transformed. Thank you very much.